Hello and welcome to today's psychotic webinar, Introducing Secret Server Vault, Privilege Account Protection for Every Small and Medium-Sized Business. Thank you for joining us. My name is Jordan and I'll be your host today. And I'd like to introduce our presenter, Psychotics Product Manager, Dan Rich. Dan has a background in IT sales, pre-sales, and technical support, and has been working with IT software and security for over eight years. When he's not working on Secret Server Roadmap, he interviews customers to better understand the security challenges they face. We are excited to share our latest solution, Secret Server Vault, with you today, making it possible for every SMB to move beyond personal password managers to implement an affordable privilege account management solution. In celebration, we have a special giveaway for one lucky attendee. We'll be giving away a complete home brewers kit at the end of the webinar. After questions are answered, we will randomly select and announce the winner at the end. So please stay until after those questions are answered. And I wish you the best of luck. A little housekeeping before we do begin. By default, you will be put on mute, but we still wanna hear from you. If you have any questions during the webinar, please type them into the question box where we'll answer them at the end. And please note, the recording will be emailed to you tomorrow so you can watch it again or share with your team. And if you are interested in starting a trial, please find the link in the chat box. With this being said, I will go ahead and pass the mic over to Dan and we can go ahead and get started. Great, thanks Jordan. Um, so before we get started here, I do wanna take just a moment, um, if you're not familiar with what privileged account management means or privileged account protection, um, what we're really referring to here is any of those accounts that don't belong to a single person. So I assume pretty much everyone listening to this has some kind of active directory in their organization. Um, so maybe first name dot last name at company.com. And that's the account that you use to log in every day. Uh, Windows bothers you to say, hey, you should rotate this password every 30 days, choose a new password. No, that password isn't strong enough. Um, so that's something that, that usually Microsoft is pretty good at handling. Um, but when we start talking about those accounts that don't belong to one person, like maybe the password to your switches and routers or databases or all those other systems that usually an IT department has stashed somewhere if they need them. Um, those are the accounts that are kind of scary because if a hacker were to get their hands on some of those accounts or, or even worse, all of those accounts, um, they pretty much have the entire keys to the kingdom and they can spread through the entire network and, and it can get pretty scary. Um, so this new edition is designed for companies that don't need all the features that a Fortune 500 company might need. So you don't necessarily need, you know, uh, machine learning, analyzing everyone's behavior, looking for suspicious activity. Um, that's something that's typically a little bit more expensive than your average small or medium-sized business needs. Um, so the hardest part we found to implementing privileged account management is figuring out where to start. So that's where Secret Server Vault comes in. So um, today what we're gonna be talking about is kind of this workflow for, for what it looks like for a company that's trying to take their first step into the world of privileged account management. So typically the first thing you're gonna do is set up this vault. So I'll show you guys just how easy it is to install Secret Server and get it up and running. Um, the second step is to run discovery, scan through the network and find the accounts that are out there and get a pretty good sense of what kind of privileges those accounts have. Um, to kind of pinpoint any weaknesses you have. And then once you know what's out there, you start protecting those secrets. So you store them in a secret server, which is an encrypted vault. Um, and then we can start very carefully delegating access and deciding which users within your company have access to which passwords. And we're gonna try to go by the principle of least privilege, which is just letting users have access to the passwords that they need to do their jobs and nothing more. So I'll show you exactly how to do that. And then finally, we'll talk about controlling sessions, which is a nice way for you to let Secret Server broker connections between users and the machines they need to jump into or the databases or systems uh, in such a way that they don't even know what the password is. All right, so let's start off with a poll. Um, now you guys, uh, this is gonna be anonymous, so try to be as honest as you can, but how are you organizing your passwords today? So let me go ahead and start the poll. All right, the poll is open. So our options are post-it notes, um, which we see pretty often, uh, spreadsheets, which are probably just one step past that, personal vaults, something like KeePass, or if even anonymously you prefer not to answer, maybe, maybe the news isn't great, uh, then you can go ahead and, and answer there. So while you guys are answering this, um, it is worth taking a moment to discuss why these privileged accounts are so important. So typically from breaches that we've analyzed, what happens is 
is that after a hacker gets access to one set of credentials, like maybe a standard AD uh, username and password for a user, um, what they're going to do is try to use those credentials to spread through the network. So they're gonna jump from host to host to host with those compromised credentials looking for more valuable information. Um, so maybe it's like a spreadsheet, for example, full of passwords. Uh, in the case of Sony uh, Pictures, this was like maybe a while ago, five plus years ago, but they basically had every single critical systems password in a spreadsheet. The hackers found that, and as a result, um, a whole, I think, summer lineup of movies ended up on the internet for anyone to download before they even hit theaters. So that's sort of the worst case scenario, that somebody finds that spreadsheet full of information, um, and, that, and that's really the scary scenario. Um, and then once they have that information, they can, of course, spread through the rest of the network and start looking for the stuff they really want, which is data that they can sell. So social security numbers from your HR system or um, checking account numbers or customer data that they can steal and sell. Or maybe they just want to use that access to encrypt your whole network and hold it ransom and say, you have to pay us $5,000 in Bitcoin if you want your computers back, which is pretty common as well. Um, so now that everyone is nice and scared, um, I, I'd like to show you guys just how easy this problem can be to solve. And just so you know the results, it looks like 10% of you or so uh, are using post-it notes to hold passwords, which is not a big deal. Some Fortune 500 companies are still doing that, um, even when we tell them not to. 25% uh, said spreadsheets. 54% um, of you guys said you're using personal vaults like KeePass, which is great. That's a nice step forward. And then finally, 10% said prefer not to answer. So in terms of that easiness that I was talking about, um, let's actually take a look at just how easy it is to get Secret Server up and running. So this is one of the things that we are most famous for is the fact that you can get this vault completely set up and running in under an hour uh, and even have it scanning the network looking for those accounts in another hour. So call it two hours from the time you first hit install to the point where we're providing you with a list of all the different accounts on your systems. So I'll take you kind of through the steps of the installer here. Um, you choose which products you want to install. And then it asks you, do you have a SQL server already installed somewhere that we can use as the encrypted vault for these passwords? Or if you don't, let us install SQL Server Express for you. So this is something the installer can completely do uh, for you. And then it checks to see if you have all the prerequisites installed. So like IIS, uh, ASP.NET, that kind of thing. Um, but if you just want to be lazy and do none of these things, um, it'll tell you what, what stuff is missing and you can click that fix issues button and the installer will actually go through and install all those prerequisites for you. Now, once we've uh, established the prereqs are there, this is where we actually put in the credentials that we're going to need to access that SQL account. So you can have your IP address, what you'd like to name the database, um, what username and password you want to use to get into the database. Um, you could also use uh, a Windows account instead of that, that SQL SA account or something like that if you want to be a little bit safer. So now Secret Server knows where your vault is and how to get access to it. Um, and then the last thing, a piece of information we need to know from you is what account do you want to create for Secret Server that you're going to use to log in? Now later, I'll show you guys how to log in with Active Directory accounts, that same account that you would use to check your email every morning. You could log directly into Secret Server with it, um, but there is gonna need to be at least one account that is going to work before AD is connected. So once you guys choose that uh, username and password, it uh, double checks to make sure all the settings that you put in are correct, and then the installer does its thing. So this whole process, again, you know, takes about five minutes to click through the wizard, and then the installer itself runs for, it says 15 to 40 minutes, but I found honestly to be more like five to 10. So the entire install process is extremely straightforward. You don't need to talk to our support team, even though you have access to them, whether you're doing a trial or you purchase the software, you have complete access to our support team. Um, no one is gonna try to check, charge you extra money for professional services while this process runs. Um, this is something that honestly, even an untrained user can get through very easily. So you don't need to hire outside experts to get this thing up and running. All right, and so that's it as far as the install process goes. So now I'd like to actually open up Secret Server and show you some of the stuff that we've been talking about. So what we're gonna do is talk about how to set up your folder structure, which is more important than it sounds because we're gonna be using that folder structure to decide which users get to see what passwords. Uh, and then I'll show you guys how to link those folders to Active Directory groups. All right, so go ahead and actually log out just to show you guys what that experience looks like. So what we're gonna do is just log into Secret Server and then, come on buddy, 
Of course, I froze it mid webinar. Let's give it just a moment. Okay, so um, we are going to log in with a local account, the one that we would have created with the install process. But if we did want to log in with an AD credential, this is where we would just choose our domain. So users can just log directly in with the same account they use every morning. Um, they're probably not going to forget the password that they use in order to, you know, access their computers. It means that they don't need to have a separate account that they're going to be using in order to log into Secret Server. So this is just one more way that the administration of this product is going to be a lot easier um, for the people that are actually running it because they don't have to worry about constant forgotten passwords from users who are trying to access the system. They're just logging in with their AD account. So once we get in, um, we call this page the dashboard. So right now, the central window is showing every single password that I have access to, but it's really important to note that there could be hundreds of other passwords stored in here that we call secrets um, that are completely invisible to me because I don't have access to view all of them. So I could say, you know, for example, show me only accounts that have admin somewhere in the name or description. Uh, or if we wanted to, we could do it by template. And I could say, you know what, I only want to see Active Directory accounts and it'll filter it that way. So it's pretty easy to find the information that we need, but really it's this folder structure that governs that access. So I know I mentioned that there could be hundreds of secrets that are invisible to me right now. The same is true of folders. Um, there could be 30 other folders here or more that are completely invisible. And if, we, if someone doesn't have permission to view a folder, it's going to be invisible. So if we wanted to look at this infrastructure folder, all I have to do is click edit, and now I can see exactly who has access and who doesn't. So if you're not on this list, the folder is invisible to you. And the most important entry on here is this Active Directory group. So what we did is instead of just listing out all the users that we would like to have access to this folder, we're going to directly attach an Active Directory group right to this folder. So now anytime somebody gets added to that group in AD, they automatically have the ability to log into Secret Server and they automatically have access to the correct folder that has all the right secrets. So this means if you hired a network engineer, for example, no one has to go through and add that person's name to all those different secrets they might need to do their job. It's gonna be completely automated. Um, and then if that person gets removed from Active Directory, their access also gets removed. So you don't have to spend a whole lot of time nitpicking these permissions and changing them from day to day, since once you set up that initial folder structure and decide which teams or users have access, um, things can pretty much run on autopilot. And then we can go a little bit further than just deciding who has access to what. We can also decide who has edit rights. So maybe if you have a newer, newer employee or something that you want them to only have read access um, and set of the ability to make changes, uh, or if you want to make them an owner, they can do what I'm doing right now and they can change other users' permissions. So we have to be a little bit careful with who we give those own owner permissions to. Uh, and then the default behavior in Secret Server is that once we create a folder, all the subfolders are going to inherit those permissions. So our infra infrastructure team, that team can decide what kind of subfolders they'd like to create, how they want to organize their secrets or passwords, um, but all these different folders are going to inherit that parent folder's uh, permissions. So typically what we see is that each one of these root folders has the permissions for that team, and then the team is kind of using subfolders to just organize things for, for better access. Now, I know I mentioned that um, Secret Server is largely aimed at uh, shared accounts, those privileged accounts, but that doesn't mean that users don't have a place to put their personal stuff as well. So each user has a personal folder that they can add their own stuff to. Um, now, typically we're not talking about like really personal stuff, like your banking info or your credit card info, because there are some situations where admins will need to use a break glass feature to look into personal folders. Like maybe if somebody leaves the company and they left some really important info in their personal folder, then the admins could use that break glass feature. But because the admins of Secret Server might have access to your personal folder, we recommend only keeping stuff there that you would use at work professionally. So maybe your password to different portals that you would use for a time clock, for example, that kind of thing. So let's jump back to our PowerPoint, make sure we didn't forget anything. So we talked about root folders, subfolders, personal folders, and how to link Active Directory directly up to those folders to make things a lot easier to administer. Now, the next step here is that we need to start filling these folders. Um, so there's a couple ways we can do this. I will talk about discovery in just a moment. Um, but before we do that, I think it would be helpful just to talk about the import function. 
So let's say that you have uh, something like KeePass, which apparently 50% of you do, um, or a spreadsheet full of passwords. What you can do is you can click Import Secrets, and this is where we can either say, okay, I have a whole bunch of Active Directory accounts, and I just want to paste the spreadsheet directly in. And so that would give us the ability to basically just import a bunch of comma delimited information and create secrets out of that. So we just have to arrange the columns in the right order. So secret name, domain, user, password, notes, that kind of thing. Um, or there is actually an import export tool that we have that helps you to basically export the information from a KeePass database or a few other popular vaults, um, and then it'll convert it into a, a format that the secret server can digest. So it's not going to extract forcibly those passwords from KeePass, but if you go into KeePass and say, hey, I want to, uh, I want to export this info, secret server is going to be able to import it pretty easily and just automatically get all those secrets added to the correct folders. So this is a really easy way to kind of jumpstart this process. But if you don't have all the information you need, and probably you don't, that's where discovery comes in. So what discovery is going to do, I'll pop back to this, is it's going to scan each host that it finds on the network. So you'll tell Secret Server, hey, I want you to scan this particular Active Directory domain. Or maybe if you're a Unix Linux shop, you could say, I want to scan this IP range looking for those hosts. Uh, and then we're going to provide an inventory of all those local accounts that we found. And one of the most important things about this is that we can also see which of those accounts have administrative rights. So this way, if maybe, let's say you took away local admin rights from a bunch of users, and then you do the scan, maybe you'll find that, whoa, there's a bunch of accounts we didn't know about um, that are on these computers where people were creating administrative backdoors for themselves. Or maybe this is a sign that a breach has occurred and a hacker is actually creating those, uh, their own accounts. So you just really need to be armed with that information to make good security decisions. And then of course, the last step here is that we will create a secret for whatever accounts we found that you wanna manage. So in terms of that process, we would go to discovery network view. And this is where Secret Server is going to provide us with that kind of inventory that I was talking about. So here we see all the different machines on our network. I don't know if you can tell, but we have a Mortal Kombat nerd that built our test lab. Uh, we can see all the different accounts that are on each machine. And the most importantly, which of these are local administrators. So if maybe one of these came as a surprise to us, we could say, wow, you know, we really want to take care of this. Let's go ahead and start creating secrets. And some of these already have secrets. You can see some of these are managed, and then there's a link to the account right there. Um, but for the ones that aren't managed, we could say, you know what, I only want to hear about accounts called administrator. And so once we limit that down, did I spell that wrong? Anyway, so you can filter it down to just the accounts you care about. And then once we click import, this gives us the ability to specify, you know, what type of secret do we want to create? What folder do you want to put it in? How do you want to name it? Um, what, and then also, um, what, uh, what is the current password? If you happen to know the local admin password, you can put that in. And then once we hit next a few times, Secret Server is going to import all those accounts and it's going to drop them into whatever folder you specified. So once all those accounts land in whatever folder they're supposed to, Secret Server can do things like validate whether or not the password is correct. This is a huge advantage because what we found is that the biggest challenge with uh, getting your users to use a, a vault like this is, is adoption rate. It's, it's getting them to actually want to log into this every morning and use it every day instead of just using post-it notes or spreadsheets or pass, individual password vaults. So one of the big advantages Secret Server has is that we're gonna tell you which of these passwords are right and which are incorrect. So then at that point, you can clean the bad data out or go fix those issues and get the correct password added. And it means that your users will, will trust the information that's in here. Because if they log in and they go through all the effort of logging in and finding the right password and trying to use it and it's wrong, they're gonna get frustrated. They're gonna go back to their old behaviors. So this is, a, again, pretty critical to adoption rate and making sure that the project does not fail, that you don't end up paying for software that becomes shelfware, which is a, a pretty big risk in this industry. So this is something that we found to be tremendously helpful. Now, um, the next thing I wanna show you guys is an example of a secret, something we haven't even really looked at yet. Uh, so here is uh, the favorite secrets widget that I find to be very convenient for demos. And this is something that you could also do like recent secrets if you wanted to have a quick, quick little shortcut here. So each user can customize this dashboard however they want to. So I have this little mini view that gives us some information. So I can see the secret name, the domain, the username, the password, and I can click this little padlock if I wanna see what it is. I can copy it to clipboard either manually or by clicking that button. But if I want more information, this is where I can click view and it takes us into this full screen page that gives us a bit more information. 
uh, for example, the heartbeat status. When was the last time we checked it? Okay, it was at 10.40 a.m. You know, we can probably be pretty confident that this password is still good. Or let's say we wanted to look at previous passwords. Here we can see that uh, we've been using the Secret Server password generator to make strong passwords, or at least extremely random passwords, and you can see the date on which all those password changes occurred. And I'll talk in a little bit about how we can go one step further. So once we've run discovery, we've imported all that stuff into the right folders, you notice that I can just look at the password and that's usually fine that a, a person's logging into a secure vault, but we probably wanna go a little bit further to protect those secrets. So one of the ways that we're gonna do that is with two-factor authentication. So this means that that scenario that I gave before where somebody's Active Directory account got compromised is not gonna be quite as scary because we're gonna force users to pass a two-factor check on their way into the vault. So if, some, if my Active Directory password was, you know, 2018 exclamation point or something, um, and somebody were to guess that password, well, when they were logging into Secret Server, they're still gonna, uh, you know, ask, all right, what's the two-factor key? So this could be something like Radius, like the RSA token you see there. Um, it could be Google Authenticator, which is completely free and, and great. Um, it could be Duo, which is somehow even easier than Google Authenticator to use. So you have lots of different options for that two-factor, but uh, it's either going to be something you have on your person or a text message or some app on your phone. So it means that hacker would have to physically have your phone, basically, to get into Secret Server. Um, and then the next step we can do is we can start tweaking some permissions within Secret Server. So we already talked about how to control who can access each folder, but in this case, we're going to go a little bit further and say, all right, we need to decide who is going to be an administrator within Secret Server. So I can go to admin users, I can see all the different people who are currently, you know, uh, able to log into Secret Server, and then we can see some information like which of these people have two-factor turned on, uh, when, when did they last log in, and so we could do something like, you know what, let's just grab everyone here, so I'll just highlight everyone, and then we're going to do a bulk operation and we're going to turn on Google Authenticator. So turning on two-factor is pretty easy for all these different users, but one other thing we need to do is decide who's going to be an administrator in here, and that's where roles come in. So these are all the different default rules, uh, excuse me, roles, and you can see that the administrator role has pretty much every possible permission. So they can do backups, they can configure all sorts of different stuff, um, pretty much everything, on it, everything possible. But our standard user permission is much more limited in what it can do. So, sorry, this whole in demo environment is running on a laptop, so once in a while it hiccups on me. But I guess it's worth mentioning you should probably install this onto a server. Uh, okay, so here's the default user role, which we can see is much more limited in what it can do. So they can add secrets, copy secrets, delete secrets, all that good stuff. Um, but for example, one thing that a standard user can't do is create folders. So if you said, you know what, I want to change that. I want to make it so that our standard users can create folders. I don't see the harm in it. Well, now you can see all these different options. So we could just go to administer folders, pop it into the left column, and now our users have the ability to create folders. Uh, or you could create a new role from scratch and call it folder admin, and maybe you know give that to somebody on top of their existing user permission. So we get pretty granular with what you can do with these permissions, and then once we have them the way we like them, that's where we can start assigning roles. And this is where, again, we can see right now we only have a single administrator, but if we wanted to add more people, this is where we could choose either individual users or, as I mentioned before, uh, Active Directory groups can also be used. So anyone who's in maybe an AD group called Secret Server Admins automatically gets added to this group, and now they can do all those administrative functions that we talked about within the program. And then one last thing I wanted to mention, I think you guys saw those like relatively weak passwords being used here. I think it's like 12 characters long. So if you really wanted to be gung-ho about it, that's where you can go into secret templates. And this is where we can customize pretty much everything about secrets. So I could say, you know what? I wanna look at password requirements and our default password requirement is only 12 characters, but maybe we'd like to change that to be something more like 16 characters. Or if you really wanna go out, you could say, you know what? We want to make this thing 50 characters long, and every time somebody uses the secret server to generate a password for them, it's going to create a 50 character password. So again, uh, we give you lots of different options to be granular if you need to, but for the most part, people are pretty happy with those default stock settings and just to use those 12 character passwords, at least until somebody tells them that they need to use something more advanced. Now, um, I mentioned before that 
letting people see the password can sometimes be a little bit of a risk. So even if you've gone through all the effort of making people pass a two-factor check before they get logged in, and we're only showing them just the passwords they need to do their job, there's still a risk associated with letting a person see the password because they could always maybe send that password to a friend and now their friend knows the password and can use it outside of secret server um, or if they quit or you know god forbid get fired then maybe they're walking out the door with a, a pocket full of passwords you know whether on their phone or written down so what we found to be more effective or the most effective way to do security is to actually hide the passwords from the people that are using them so what we can do is we can have Secret Server launch either RDP sessions or SSH connections through PuTTY, uh, or we can launch SQL Studio in such a way that from the user's perspective, they just click one button and they get jumped directly into the correct location using the correct account, but they never find out what that password was. So to give you guys an example of that, um, we could use this RDP launcher. So in this case, uh, if I wanna use the secret, I'm gonna have to enter a comment. So I could say, webinar is my reason and then in this case now we have a little bit of extra information about each user's access but you'll notice in that password field there's really no way for me to find out what this is that padlock icon the copy to clipboard icon they're all gone so the only way for me to use this account is by clicking this launcher icon and then we'll see that secret server just opens up the rdp client and jumps me directly where i need to go so now I can do my job, but I can't give this password to my friends. I can't walk out of the building with this password, you know, uh, memorized or anything like that. So it's, again, pretty important from a security perspective um, to be able to hide those passwords from the people that are using them. And again, it's not just RDP, even though that is the most common. We could also launch a Unix Linux session. So here we have, I believe, a Linux host. And I can click the RDP, or excuse me, the SSH launcher. And we'll see that PuTTY pops up. We have a nice little, you know, terminal looking window here. Uh, or we could do the exact same thing for SQL Studio. And I could let maybe our DBA or somebody else who needs access to the database jump right in, uh, again, without knowing what this password is. And SQL Studio starts a little bit more slowly than the other two, but again, it's, it's pretty close to instantaneous, certainly faster than that user looking it up in a key pass or a spreadsheet or a post-it note and then typing it. So we, we're, our goal here is to make your admin's lives easier while also making things more secure, because if you say this is way more secure, but it's gonna take you 10 times as long, uh, they're probably not gonna go along with it. They're gonna do everything in their power to, <laughs> to fight you on this and, and use the stuff that they've been used to because admins don't like being slowed down. They wanna be able to get their work done quickly. Typically, those guys are pretty overworked. So anything we can do to make their lives easier is gonna be great. And then last but not least, there is the reporting aspect of this. So if you're an administrator for these systems, this probably doesn't concern you very much, but if you're the manager of one of these teams or somebody who's responsible for this information, uh, it becomes critical that you have all this information at your disposal. So Secret Server does store audit information about exactly what user um, performed which action at which time. I'll show you guys that in a second. And then there's a whole bunch of different reports that you could either view in your browser, you could schedule it to be emailed, you could even make widgets to just kind of get a sense of what's going on through a dashboard rather than looking at individual reports. So first, let's look back at that secret that we looked at before, that very first one where we can and look at the password. If I click view audit, this will give me all the information about what happened. So you can see that uh, I viewed the password a few times, I displayed it, I copied it to clipboard. Earlier, I changed the password. So all that information does show up in here. We can see timestamps on exactly when that happened. Um, but if you wanna go a bit further and actually see some you know, more widespread information instead of just one secrets, we could say something like, um, how about this? What secrets can a user see? So this would help us to spot check our permissions. So we could put in a certain person that we don't trust, like maybe Clark Kent here, seems like a suspicious character. We'll hit update report. And then now we can see exactly what passwords that user has access to, um, just to, again, to make sure that our permissions are what we thought they were. Uh, or if we wanted to maybe see who hasn't logged in in the last 90 days, maybe we forgot to disable the account of a user. Here we can see some more accounts of people that just haven't logged in in a while. And if we wanted to have these reports sent to us, all you have to do is click schedule and then Secret Server will say, you know what, let's create a new scheduled report and email it out maybe every Monday morning or something like that to a manager that needs to know some of this information. And finally, if looking at reports directly or um, scheduling them and getting them in the email doesn't uh, 
appeal to you. A third option would be to just use the dashboard, dashboard customization I talked about before, and you can just start basically attaching reports to a tab here. So I can just make a new tab, fill it with whatever reports I want. I can name this tab whatever I want, and it just gives us an idea of how discovery scanning is going, um, which secrets are being used, um, which passwords meet compliance or don't, or even just a general activity feed that shows you everything that's been happening. So you can see all the stuff that I've been doing today is, uh, is listed there. So reporting, again, not super interesting typically, but there is one report in particular that I think is kind of fun. And so we mentioned that situation before where somebody leaves the organization, again, maybe willingly, maybe not willingly, um, but what the user audit report lets us do is it lets us see all the passwords that a user had access to during their tenure with the company. So let's say this admin John Doe started on January 1st, today's their last day. We can now get a list of every single password that they saw that has not been changed since. So basically everything they might have written down or memorized, we have a to-do list to go through and change those passwords uh, just to make sure that we don't get into a situation where somebody gets fired, drives to a nearby coffee shop, hops on the Wi-Fi and starts messing with company resources. You have a, a nice report here to show you exactly what stuff needs to be changed that that person might know. Oh, I've got to breathe for a second. I've been talking for 30 minutes straight. Um, so the last thing I did want to show you guys is that we this is on-prem typically. So that install process that I walked you through, even though it only takes 10 minutes, some of our customers are saying, look, we appreciate that it's easy to install, but we don't want to install it. We don't want to have a server on our infrastructure. We, we use cloud everything, or we want software as a service. And that's where Secret Server Cloud comes in. So all the features that I just showed you will work um, through something that we call a distributed engine. So basically, even though Secret Server Cloud is being hosted in Azure and your users can log into that Secret Server website anywhere they want to, even if they're not on the company network, um, the way that we're able to access your network to do things like discovery scanning or heartbeat, where we check if the password is correct, is through this engine. So all you have to do is install this single Windows service on whatever machine you want to. Um, Secret Server Cloud is never going to talk directly to the engine. All the communication comes from the engine first. So the engine Secret Server says, well, I've got a bunch of tasks ready for the engine. The engine phones home and says, hey, do you have any work? And Secret Server says, I certainly do. Sends it to the engine. And then after the engine does everything it needs to do, checks you know, 100 passwords, for example, it then reports back to, the, to Secret Server Cloud with all the results to say 30 out of these 40 passwords were good, 10 were bad. And then of course, Secret Server updates that information so anyone that's actually viewing that page can see the latest and greatest. So uh, I've been talking for 30 minutes straight. Uh, let's give you guys a chance. So if there's any questions uh, that you haven't asked, please feel free to use the uh, kind of chat or question function. And then Jordan can kind of go through a few questions here. Yeah, we have some coming through here. Um, so first, uh, question we have is, um, is there an import, or I guess you may have covered this, but just to confirm, can you import from other competitor software if downloaded to a text file? Yep, absolutely. So you just have to do a little bit of work cleaning up the columns because Secret Server is expecting that data to be in a certain order. So we saw like secret name, username, password, domain, that kind of thing. Um, so you might just have to put it in a spreadsheet and kind of reorganize the columns a little bit. But yes, it, it's pretty easy if you get the data in the right format for Secret Server to absorb it. Excellent, thank you. And uh, do we support you to key for multi-factor authentication? That is a good question. Um, if we don't have it right now, we are working on it because I know that's pretty huge right now. I think Google is also coming out with their own version of like a YubiKey type thing. Um, I'm almost positive the answer is yes, um, but hang tight. I'll get an answer for you by tomorrow. Perfect. And where does the RDP launcher launch the RDP app from? A jump server? Nope, no jump server. It's actually opening the RDP client locally on each user's computer. So the first time you want to use a launcher, Secret Server will ask you to download something called the protocol handler. So it's not like an agent or anything that runs permanently. It's just a process that when you click that launch button, it uh, is basically acting as a broker. So it's going to open the RDP client locally on the end user's computer, and it's going to hand off the username and a password in a secure way where the user can't intercept it, where someone can't pull it out of memory, for example. Cool. And can Secret Server logs be sent to logarithm? 
Um, so the higher editions of Secret Server can do that, but Vault Edition, no. So you do have access to pretty much the same information. So if you browse to admin system log, you have the information right here and you could, if you wanted to um, export it regularly. Hold on, let me try that again. Come on, buddy. And you'll have all the information about what, what's going wrong or any errors or any actions that are happening and you can uh, export it out. But no, that pipeline of data to a SIM solution, we're kind of assuming that customers who have something like Splunk um, probably need a higher addition to Secret Server. Okay, next question we have here is, so in a nutshell, this software uses a key path like password storing system merged with an active directory like security group? Uh, yep, and then also is using uh, some sort of RPC functionality to go out and validate those passwords as well, which is a pretty pretty big differentiator. But yeah, that's a good way to, to summarize it. Okay, and um, the question is replica servers? Question mark. Um, we may need additional information on that. Or Dan, do you know what that person may be referring to? I think they're probably asking about high availability, which is again something that does get included in some of the higher editions of Secret Server, where you could have two or three or more of these web servers running concurrently and sort of uh, load balance together, so that if one goes down, people can access the others. Um, but no, if this is if it's if high availability is really important to you, I would recommend looking at the cloud version, since we do include it there. Um, where we're hosting it in Azure, we have we want to keep it up, you know, as close to 100% of the time as we can. But if it is going on-prem, no, you would be limited to just one node. Okay. Sounds Actually, that's great. a really good point. Hold on, I should probably expand on that a little bit. Um, I'm referring to the front-end okay. web servers that do the things like uh, Heartbeat, for example, or discovery scanning. Um, but if you're talking about the back-end database, that's something where if you have a Microsoft SQL license, which most organizations do, uh, then you have the ability to do stuff like mirroring or always on, where you could have a cluster of database servers all you know, kind of automatically failing over. So from that perspective, you could do some high availability on the back end, and then all you'd have to worry about is if the front end server went down, well, you know, you could just use that, maybe a copy of the VM to get it back up and running. Or worst case scenario, if you had to install from scratch, you'd be looking at maybe 15, 20 minutes of an outage when you went through that install process that I just showed you. And then Secret Server would say, is there an existing database? And you'd say, yep, all my data is already in there. And it would just connect right back up. Excellent. Um, next question here is, is Secret Server in Azure multi-tenant? or each client must have its own installation of Secret Server in Azure? That's a good question. I believe it's multi-tenant for Secret Server Vault, um, but in such a way that you know, no one would ever have access to your data. But actually, no, I'm pretty sure it is single tenant. Never mind, ignore that. Yeah, I'm pretty sure it's one, one tenant for each, uh, each customer. Perfect. And what we can do too is following this webinar, we can go ahead and confirm that answer as well. Um, next question here is, can Secret Server Cloud be used without the engine? Um, I suppose it could be if you didn't want to use stuff like Active Directory authentication, um, because Secret Server does need to be able to talk to your domain controller in order to check if people's AD credentials are correct. Um, and it does need access to your network to do stuff like discovery scanning or heartbeat. Um, so if you didn't want to use any of those features, honestly, Secret Server free might be better for you. Um, if you don't need the, the bells and whistles and you just want a place to store some passwords and that's it, there is a free edition of Secret Server. Perfect, and that actually um, moves us right into the next question perfectly, which is, what are the primary differences here between this and the pro version? And then Dan, maybe you can kind of say also what our free version. Sure, so free is basically just storage. Um, and then Vault Edition does bring in the stuff that basically needs the engine, right? So discovery scanning, heartbeat, um, password validation, that kind of thing. And then professional is where we start getting into Secret Server actually rotates these accounts for you. So you could say, okay, you know what, here's the domain admin account. I want you to go through and change every local admin password on my whole network to something random. So it gives you a little bit more flexibility to start actually not just using this as a system to read passwords and validate and store them, but to actually start reaching out to other networks and changing stuff. Um, and then finally, our highest license edition, Platinum, is going to go a step further than that and actually do stuff like uh, interact with your service accounts. 
So whenever you change a service account password, it would reach out to every service or scheduled task or app pool on the network and update those with the new credentials um, or uh, maybe set up rules to not even have to click an import button, just anytime you find a new account, automatically import it. Um, so lots of other cool stuff. And we do have a page on our website that compares all four editions um, that would probably be helpful. Yeah, absolutely. And I can also include that in the follow-up email uh, with a recording tomorrow for everyone. Next question is, what do you think is the best way to recover from a password breach? And um, I went ahead and sent the person, actually we had just last, um, last month hosted this webinar on breached implementing incident response for a compromised credentials. So I shared that link. But Dan, did you have any additional pieces that you wanted to add on, on what the best way to recover from a password breach would be? Sure, and, and the thing is that webinar is kind of going by industry best practices, like stuff like talk to your legal team and have a plan ready. Um, but generally the, the kind of customers that are gonna be using Secret Server Vault Edition to just kind of start down this PAM journey are, are probably the type, type of customers that don't have a bunch of attorneys in the building. Um, so things tend to be a little different. So I, I'd say the, the best advice I would have post breach is to change every single password um, just to try to get a fresh start. So if you were using eight character passwords, bump it up to 20 character passwords and go through and just change every password on all those different switches and routers and databases and systems that you have access to just to make sure that you're not still being attacked. Um, because what we have found is that when a breach occurs, it usually takes like 100 plus days between that initial password being hacked and the, whatever action that hacker is going to take, like stealing a bunch of data. So you might be able to get it in that window where somebody has gotten access to your network, but they're still just kind of sniffing around looking for weaknesses. So if you go ahead and just rotate out all those passwords, then you can start digging through logs and trying to do some investigation, figure out which account got hacked. Um, and then one other thing that we haven't really talked about on this webinar because we don't offer it as a product, but something that's just really great uh, best practice in general is to do phishing training for your employees so they know not just how to not click a bad attachment, although that is important, but also if somebody were to call them and say, hey, I'm calling from Duo, would you open up your Duo app and tell me what the number says? Like, You really need to train people to not trust that kind of communication because phishing is, is usually just working based on you know politeness and trust and the fact that if someone sounds official and they're asking for this information uh, it sounds like you should give it to them but that kind of training can be counterintuitive and, and I even know some experienced IT admins that have been fooled by emails that say UPS attachment or UPS shipping label and they happen to order something on Amazon the day before so they click it and it turns out it's ransomware it shuts down their computer so there are some best practices you can use but honestly for mid-breach or post-breach, just change those passwords out as soon as you possibly can and make sure that everyone knows that, hey, if, if all this info appears out on a, a website somewhere or starts getting sold, your phone's gonna ring off the hook. It does help to have a plan in place to say if we do, you know, all of a sudden, if all our customer data gets posted on the dark web and angry customers start calling us, we need to have a plan ready to go so we're not trying to come up with it on the fly mid-panic. Great, thank you so much. Than you <laughs> no, that was good, that was great. Um, next question here is, can you talk about installing on multiple servers for redundancy purposes? Yeah, that's a great point. Um, so Secret Server does give you the ability to do a few different activations. And the assumption there is that this is you might have multiple instances for production or um, like dev test, that kind of thing. So, uh, and also disaster recovery. So if you wanted to have a second node set up somewhere um, that you know if the primary node go, does go down, you could just flip the switch and activate that second one. The difference between that and the high availability I was talking about before is that they both can't be on active, active, talking to one another. Instead, you would just have one primary and one failover. If the primary goes down, someone just takes five minutes for someone to go flip the switch and turn on that second one. And if you're really tech savvy, I have talked to some customers that have automated this process so if you're a PowerShell wizard, maybe you could set it up. So if the primary goes down, it automatically you know, brings up the secondary and changes DNS to reroute everyone to that second one. But typically, again, for, for the kind of customers we're aiming Vault at, um, it's just gonna be a manual five minute process of flipping the second one on and then you know, turning the, the primary off and either sending users an email that says, hey guys, secret server one is down, please browse to secret server two. Or again, you could just make a DNS change. Great. Perfect. And can secrets be exported or printed in case the server is down or inaccessible? 
Yes, absolutely. And so we want to be kind of careful with who we give that power to, the export secrets. Um, so this is where each user is going to have to put in their password before they can export it, just in case, you know, you go to the bathroom and someone sneaks up to your desk and tries to export all these secrets. Um, but you can also control which users can do it. And then you can choose what type of format, which folders. So maybe you just want to export one folder, or if you don't choose any, it'll just spit out everything, which can be a nice uh, sort of last line of defense, just in case, you know, uh, your entire VM infrastructure goes down, for example. It would be nice to have uh, maybe a hard copy printed out or on a maybe USB drive and a safe or something like that. Good question. Yeah, a lot of great questions coming through. Um, and then we have another one um, on users. So how can the user edit passwords in his or her personal folder? Um, so anything that's in your personal folder, you're going to have owner rights on. So that means that you'll have the ability to just click edit. So for example, this guy has a SQL account in here. So we have the server, the username and the password. So if I click edit, then that'll give me the ability to show the password. Hopefully this is a real, real classy password one. Um, so this is where we could just go ahead and enter our new password and see it if we want to, and then save it. Or you could let secret server generate it. I should probably do this right. Uh, and then let Secret Server generate us a better password that we would use. And then we would save it. Great. And are there any limitations for the codec to be used for Fortune 50 companies? Uh, no, I, I think we have a handful of them using our software. So no, there there are no limitations in that regard. I, I don't think a Fortune 50 company would want the Vault Edition. They would probably want some of the more advanced features. But uh, but yeah, we, we do have plenty of uh, plenty of extremely large customers using the same software. Yeah, absolutely. And um, who does the installation in, uh, on Azure, Psychotic or each client reseller? Uh, so it's software as a service, so we handle all that for you, and, and it's not even like a person is going to go roll up their sleeves and install it for you. It, it's a completely automated process. So if you wanted to start a cloud trial, um, you just go ahead and click provision or something like that in our cloud portal, and then it spins it up for you, and you can log, it, log in. So uh, no, you're never going to have to do those install tasks if you if you're using the cloud version. Now, with that being said, um, we do have some customers that have chosen to install this into their own cloud. Um, but it gets a little bit weird with like the distributed engines and things. Um, so I would recommend either using the software as a service or the on-prem, at least for Vault Edition. Once you start moving into those higher editions, you can actually buy more distributed engines. So you could build your own cloud product, but, but Vault is not really appropriate for that. Great. And um, We'll take this as the last question and all other questions we'll go ahead and answer. Um, we'll follow up personally with you. Um, but last question here is, if someone has administrator access to secret server, do they also have access to all passwords? So there is a way that you can do that called unlimited admin. And I actually was tinkering with this before the webinar started. So you might just saw me dart in and turn this off at the beginning. Um, so this unlimited admin mode, you can be pretty careful about who has the right to turn this on. So one thing that we recommend for security is that you could make it so that one user has the ability to turn this mode on, but not benefit from it. And a second user has cannot turn it on. They'll never see this button, but when unlimited admin mode is turned on, they can look into every folder. So what you end up with is a situation where it kind of takes two people turning the key at the same time in order to, to flip this on. But now I can see every personal folder if I have to go digging around in someone else's stuff. So. Everyone sees this big blue banner, not just admins, that says, whoa, unlimited admin mode is on, be careful. Um, there's also a report that you can run that shows you all the actions that were taken while unlimited admin mode was on, just to make sure that nobody can abuse this feature. Um, you could also set up something we call an event subscription, which we didn't really have time to talk about today, which is an email alert that you can send when specific actions happen. So we could say, for example, I wanna create a new event subscription, and I'll call it unlimited admin alert. And then we're going to email everyone, and the event is going to be unlimited administrator mode was enabled. So you saw that literally took like 15 seconds, and now we have an alert that's just going to blast an email out every time somebody turns this mode on. So lots of stuff we can do from a security standpoint to protect this feature, but yes, it does exist, this break glass feature. 
Excellent. Thank you so much. Um, everyone else that we were unfortunately get able, unable to get to um, your question, we will personally reach out. And Dan, did you have anything else that you'd like to say before we go ahead and announce the winner of the uh, Home Brewers Kit? No, I was going to say I'm very curious about the Home Brewer thing. So yeah, let's get, <laughs> get to it. Awesome. Yeah. No, it's um, the first time giving this away. So um, I'm excited to go ahead and announce uh, the winner as Cole. And we will go ahead and Cole will follow up with you immediately after this webinar to go ahead and get that sent to you so you can start uh, crafting up your own brew. And everyone else, uh, we will email you after um, the webinar with a recording. And also, I just don't want to leave everyone empty handed because you didn't win the home brewer's kit. Um, if you are ready to go ahead and kickstart your privilege account management security program and you want to go ahead and start a trial of secret server vault uh, today until um, Monday, we will go ahead and send you a $10 Amazon gift card for anyone that does start that trial. And you will receive a link in uh, your webinar recording email tomorrow uh, with the link to start your trial. So use that link to get your $10 Amazon gift card. And just want to say thank you so much for everyone's participation today. There were a lot of great questions coming through. And we hope you enjoyed our webinar. And like I mentioned, if we weren't able to get to your question, we will personally reach out to you after this. And if you do have any questions that come up later in the day, please feel free to contact our team at webinar at And look out for that email tomorrow with the webinar recording and slides and a link to start your trial and get your $10 Amazon gift card. Thank you so much again for joining us today and I look forward to seeing you on future webinars.